lot of you out there. Um, my name is Jeff Thomas. <clears throat> I'm uh, Onondaga, Turtle Clan. My family's from the Six Nations Reserve in Southern Ontario. I was born and raised in the city of Buffalo, New York. I thought long and hard about um, how to condense um, almost four decades of work looking at indig indigeneity <clears throat> excuse me, within the city and uh, how to uh, kind of call it down to seven minutes. So I kind of took a departure from my usual presentations where I just start talking and I actually wrote something for, for tonight. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. I should probably also mention too that um, I'm, I'm based here in Ottawa and uh, my journey on the path to understanding the urban world began in 1979. I was in a car accident uh, traveling between Six Nations and Buffalo and um, I fell asleep and hit a telephone pole. <clears throat> I was trying to get back to go to work and that was the first time that I had actually um, directly faced uh, racism when I was in the hospital. Uh, I had a, a broken neck and they thought that I was a malinger. So it kind of transformed me in terms of looking at my life and social issues and what I wanted to do. And because I couldn't work again, um, my plans to move to Six Nations were curtailed and I began to focus on what I thought my elders had prepared me for, which was to um, address the urban world. And to them, I give thanks and I'll begin. While I was considering a topic for my presentation, I began reviewing what I had accomplished during my career as a photo-based image maker and curator. And if I had achieved my goal of connecting two words, Indian and urban. I decided to begin my presentation <clears throat> with a story that took place when I was 10 years old and eventually culminated in this building, the Canadian Museum of History in 1998, when I curated the exhibition Emergence from the Shadows. I just returned to Buffalo now I'm beginning to go back to my childhood as a reference point here. I just returned to Buffalo with my grandmother from a weekend visit at the Six Nations Reserve. It was a humid late summer evening and I walked to the corner store to see if my friends were around. It was late, so I sat on the steps of PS number 19 and waited. The night was very calm and muted and my mind began to drift and recall what I had learned from my family elders. I mentioned PS number 15 because it was my grade school at the time and where my first protest took place. My elder, Miss Emily General, was a former school teacher on the reserve, a land rights and traditional governance activist, and one of the founding members of the Indian Defense League and of the Woodland Theater Company. The theater company production centered on stories of important indigenous figures from the past like Joseph Brandt and the Huron Peacemaker. Being with family elders on the reserve was the polar opposite of my life back in the city where there seemed to be no place that nurtured my growing indigenous identity or to help me navigate the slippery slope of fitting in that often heads down for people like my father and my grandfathers. Although, <clears throat> I, was, uh, although I was young, I was old enough to know that there were challenging cultural and identity issues associated with life in the city for indigenous people, yet no one seemed interested in talking about them. But my questions continued to build over the years, often inspired by Emily and her stories of activism and her thoughts on the importance of knowing our history. When I returned to PS number 19, I asked my teacher why we didn't learn about my history as well. When my question was brushed aside, I refused to recite the Pledge of Allegiance we had to say every morning until a compromise was reached. I had to stand, but I didn't have to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. So the night I sat on the school steps, I said to myself, remember, everything you see, hear, smell, and feel at this moment because this is who you are. What awaited me was a challenge of finding a way to put my questions into action. Emily once said during a conversation with friends, I wonder what happened to the information the anthropologist from Ottawa had collected from Pa. I wanted to prove to Emily that I was sincere about the questions I was raising and I made a vow to track down the anthropologist and bring her news about her father's records. My, re my vow returned to the forefront of my work in 1993 when I moved to Ottawa to begin research project at Library and Archives Canada. Within three years, I was invited to co-curate my first exhibition with archivist Edward Tompkins. The title was Aboriginal Portraits from the National Archives of Canada. 
The title reflected my thoughts on the archive becoming somewhat like a family photo album for the indigenous community and for challenging Indian stereotypes held by the non-indigenous community as well. In 1998, Gerald McMaster, then curator of indigenous art at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, invited me to curate an exhibition based upon photographs in the museum collection, produced by anthropologists during their field work in indigenous communities across Canada. I was excited to work with this archive because a great deal of the field work had taken place at Six Nations, beginning in 1913. One of the anthropologists I highlighted from my exhibition was Francis Knowles, a physical anthropologist from England. I found his glass plate negatives in the museum's cold storage vault, and I recognized names Knowles had written on the negative sleeves, people I had heard my elders speak about. Written on one envelope was the name Chief Jacob General, and I wondered if this was Emily's father. When I put the negative on the light table, I immediately saw a striking resemblance to the old black and white photograph Emily had hanging on her dining room wall. The image showed an aged man wearing coveralls and sporting a handlebar mustache, and he was posed by towering stalks of white corn. I was shocked and overwhelmed by the connection I had made. The unfortunate part was the fact that my elders had passed away. I could only imagine the conversation we could have had. The exhibition ran for, two, for over two years, and in the end, I asked the museum to donate the prints to the Woodland Cultural Center in Brantford, Ontario. The center put the portraits on display and invited people from the reserve to add information to the database. I had finally fulfilled my vow. In 2017, I added a new wampum belt to my series, Where the Rivers Meet, commemorating the influence of Emily and the vow I made, and also including the photograph of Chief Jacob General on the right-hand side. I want to end my presentation with a return visit I made to Buffalo in 2001. I drove over to PS number 19 to photograph the school steps. The building was still there, and where I sat that summer night, a sign now was over the doorway that read Native American Magnet School and the Haudenosaunee flag was flying overhead. The friend I visited in Buffalo told me his son was now teaching Native American studies at the school. We may not change the physical structure of a city, but in the end, we have control over our voices and how we raise our children and inspire them <clears throat> to write their own stories. We have to create a positive environment and listen to our children's questions. We have to become the explorers and navigators of the new world order and build a new form of architecture that begins with the empowering of the imagination and provide our children with a reason for living. Just as my son was looking out the streetcar window in the first photograph, we must not settle for surviving colonialism and residential schools. We must dream, question, and explore. Thank you. I, I'll just end by saying that um, it's been a long road in trying to come to some sort of conclusion about urban AD and how it reflects to us as indigenous people. And I think in terms of sitting here tonight and being in the museum, it has been a part of my, of my journey in looking at collections and determining what can be used, what can be utilized, how we can incorporate it into that quest for self-determination. The battle goes on, and my work continues to build on this narrative. And in the coming years, I'll be producing more projects. And also, I think we've reached a point as well where it's time that we do bring our work back to the children in our communities and to the larger community. The idea, I think, in the end is how do we build a world where we get along with one another as opposed to always finding the differences. And my hope is, by being out and speaking in public, that I can raise an awareness of that, not only of our stories, but listening to those stories and incorporating them into what now is becoming quickly an indigenous city. Thank you. <laughs>